Hello, and welcome back to another installment of the needlessly detailed exploration of punctuation. Today, we are talking all about word classes. That's right, word classes. The grammatical categories imposed upon language in an attempt to make it all make sense. You'll likely know this discussion is something along the lines of nouns are things, verbs are actions, and adjectives describe. And these descriptions are useful as a rule of thumb, a general guide. But they just are not entirely accurate and don't account for all syntactic classifications. They work for the bulk of cases, but are not so useful when we are looking at more complex usages. So today I want to take a look at the syntactic and morphological criteria used to identify and distinguish between the word classes in English. As a reminder, morphological criteria is all about what's happening within a word, how that word is constructed from different meaningful segments, while syntactic criteria is all about how that word can combine with other words into larger meaningful units. And I talk about both in greater detail back in part one of this adventure. All right, so why am I discussing word classes today? Well, for the uninitiated, I'm currently on a mission to define an English sentence in all the nitty gritty detail, all as part of a larger quest to determine the standard use of English punctuation, starting with the humble full stop or period. To be honest, it's all just an excuse to talk about descriptive grammar. And word classes is an important concept within this discussion, already evidenced in our lengthy explorations of nouns and verbs. Whilst prepositions, adjective, determiners aren't quite so crucial for defining a sentence, they are still part of many sentences and in some situations will be required to complete the clause. Additionally, as we have already touched upon, the word classes do not exist in isolation and so gaining a good understanding of tests for verbs and nouns is reliant on being able to perform tests such as whether the word in question can be modified by an adjective. Meaning we need to also discuss these other grammatical categories. And with that out of the way, let's begin. The logical way of transitioning into discussing each word class in turn would probably be to start with summarizing what the word classes are, how many there are, maybe listing them off. But that's actually easier said than done. I could say in English that there are seven word classes. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, determiners, prepositions, and conjunctions. Or I could say there are eight and add in pronouns as its own discrete category. Then there's interjections. Those are considered a word class by some. Let's call it nine. Or we could even split conjunctions into subordinators and coordinators and yield ourselves a lovely round ten. Every grammar guide, online summary, YouTube video on the topic will likely take a slightly different view on exactly how to dice things up. And that's okay. The truth is the academic field of linguistics does not at this stage have a consensus on the best way to describe the grammar of English. We don't even have a solid cross-linguistic definition of the word word. But here we are still talking about words and still finding new layers of meaning. So I can't give you an accurate undisputed number of word classes, but I can still talk about them. And I will be talking about all 10 of these categories slash subcategories I just mentioned, starting with nouns. Semantically, nouns often describe people, places, things, concepts, emotions, all that type of stuff. Many but not all nouns can be counted and nouns may be able to have ownership of another noun or be owned by another noun. Morphologically, nouns can take a number of derivational morphemes, for example, meant to form a noun from a verb, agreement, Ness to form a noun from an adjective, happiness, quirkiness. In regards to inflectional morphemes, nouns can change form to show plurality. Usually this is done by the addition of the plural s, but we also have irregular forms like child becoming children, datum becoming data, platypus becoming platypode. If a term inflects in any way to be counted, one chip, two chips, you have yourself a noun. Syntactically, they can be substituted for a pronoun. The cat ate dinner, 
He ate dinner. They can appear after an adjective being modified by it, the fast car, the happy cat, and they can be headed by a determiner or possessive pronoun. The cat, an apple, her existential crisis. Within the overarching category of noun, we have a few different subcategories that are often discussed. Proper nouns, which in English take capital letters, are the names of specific people, places, and even things like months of the year. Proper nouns often will not take determiners. Casper ate his breakfast, not the Casper ate his breakfast. This is not a blanket rule, however. Some proper nouns do take determiners. The Eiffel Tower. Even proper nouns that don't usually take a determiner can potentially in some contexts. The Casper who woke up this morning was a very different cat to the one who came home from his day of adventure. Certainly, however, it's common to see proper nouns without any determiner. We also have pronouns, which are sometimes considered a category of noun and sometimes considered a word class in their own right. As already discussed, pronouns can be subbed for other noun phrases, supporting that they play the same role as noun phrases and therefore are a noun phrase themselves. But if we consider a more form versus function approach, there are a number of striking differences between pronouns and other nouns that can be used to support pronouns being better described as their own word class, one that simply is capable of performing the same function as nouns. Pronouns are used to stand in place of either an already referenced or soon to be referenced noun phrase. Pronouns are useful as they allow us to discuss things without needing to con continuously repeat the potentially lengthy noun phrase. Unlike nouns that are considered an open word class, pronouns are considered a closed word class, meaning it is difficult and slow for new pronouns to emerge in a language. In general, new words gain traction easiest when either they are formed using pre-existing morphemes, such as through blending, compounding, or affixing, when they are borrowed from a foreign language widely spoken in the community, or when the new term is created to describe a completely new thing otherwise lacking a label, a product, a new type of action. And so nouns, super easy to have new ones coming into common usage all the time. Pronouns, not so much, but not impossible. The most common changes to the pronoun paradigm usually come from existing pronouns falling out of usage or having the constraints of their usage shift and change, such as thy falling out of usage and the originally plural you spreading into also being used for the singular. Some more differences between pronouns and nouns. Pronouns do not take determiners. You cannot say the he did that. They also can't be modified by adjectives and they don't take derivation or morphemes. They can, however, inflect, changing form to indicate singular versus plural, just like nouns, but also changing to indicate person, in some cases gender, and case, or the role the noun plays in the clause. Whilst modern English nouns do not inflect for gender or case, there are many languages with nouns that do inflect for these things, including Old English. So these do not necessarily mark pronouns as its own unique word class, but the syntactic differences between these two groups might have you considering they are best analyzed as discrete. And with that, let's turn our attention to the next category, the verbs. Semantically, verbs are actions, states of being, things that occur at a place in time, past, present, or future, and usually have an end point, meaning they can either be in progress or completed. Morphologically, some verbs can take derivational morphemes, such as prefixes like un to indicate negation, re to indicate an action has been repeated, she tied her hair, untied it, and retied it. Verbs inflect for tense and aspect, I wrote yesterday, I am writing right now, today, I will have finished writing sometime in the future. In English, tense and aspect paradigms have a combination of morphological and syntactic components, for example, the simple past tense is usually formed with the suffix ed or t, whilst the present can continuous form is constructed by adding the corresponding present tense form of the verb to be and then also the suffix ing. I am writing, he is writing. Verbs also inflect it for person number agreement, taking an s suffix for third person singular subjects. They inflect for mood, for example, the imperative mood, which is used to compel an implied second person subject to do an action. 
run. Verbs can be an active or passive voice. Passive voice formed by using the appropriate past tense form of the verb to be and then taking the past participle form of the verb in question. The cat ate breakfast. Breakfast was eaten by the cat. Syntactically, this construction results in the verb valency, the number of noun arguments it takes, decreasing by one, with the object of the active construction becoming the subject of the passive construction. And yep, I have a video all about passive constructions as well, where I posit they are not a grammatical error and not the bane of good writing that they are so often portrayed as. Moving on, syntactically verbs can be modified by an adverb, they can take modal verbs such as may, can, could, would, should, and they can be negated with not. She did not do that. Just like nouns, verbs can be classified into different types along a couple of different metrics. We have auxiliary or helper verbs like to be, to do, and to have, which as well as being able to head their own verb phrases can be used within other verb phrases to convey information like tense, aspect, voice, and also for emphasis. Another type of auxiliary verb are the modals, could, should, would. These ones don't ever stand alone as a verb, instead always being part of a larger verb phrase and they provide additional information such as obligation and potential. These are usually considered a type of verb because some change form for tense, but you know, an argument could be made that that too deserves to be its own word class. I have a video digging much deeper into verbs, I'll link just here, but now we hopefully have a good idea how this all works. Let's move on to introducing some word classes I haven't yet spoken about in depth. If we consider nouns and verbs the carb and protein of your meal, adjectives and adverbs are here to add some flavouring. Let's look at each in turn. Semantically, adjectives are describing words, and specifically words that describe people, places and things i.e. nouns. Morphologically, adjectives can be formed from nouns through derivational morphemes such as like, ish, full, ible, childlike, childish, beautiful, terrible, that sort of thing. Adjectives can also be modified by derivational morphemes such as un, which negates the meaning, unhappy, and ish, which softens or smudges the meaning, big ish, implying the noun can somewhat or nearly be described by the base adjective big, it's not quite big, it's big-ish. Adjectives also often have a comparative and superlative form, and these are marked using the inflectional morphemes er and est, so big, bigger, big-est. Alternatively, this semantic quality of comparison may be expressed syntactically through the use of the adverbs more and most. Other syntactical criteria of an adjective include that adjectives can be placed between a determiner and a noun, the cat, the happy. Adjectives can also be qualified by some adverbs such as very, but so can other adverbs. So this test can help distinguish an adjective from a noun, for example, but not an adjective from an adverb. The very fast car, the car was going very quickly. Speaking of distinguishing nouns and adjectives, just like nouns, adjectives can follow the copular verb is. The sunset is beautiful. If we combine this test with the last and test for whether the term can follow the construction it is very, we have a good test for an adjective because we're ruling out both nouns and adverbs. The creatures are very terrifying. You can't say the creatures are very cats. You also can't say the creatures are very quickly. Worth noting that adjectives used in this way following a copula are a specific type of adjective called a predicate adjective. We can contrast these predicate adjectives with attributive adjectives. They can be removed without impacting the grammaticality of a construction. So the happy cat, that can just end up as the cat. It's still grammatical. Please do note that the entire adjective phrase needs to be removed. So if it's being modified by an adverb, then that adverb needs to be removed. The very happy cat, you need to remove both very happy for it to be grammatical. And indeed, this goes to show that very is acting as part of an adjective phrase. Some adjectives can't be used as predicate adjectives and some adjectives can't be used as attribute adjectives. Many, however, can be used for both. Next up, adverbs. Morphologically, these are formed from adjectives with derivational morphemes such as Lee, 
happily. However, worth noting, not all adverbs end in li. Unlike adjectives, they cannot be placed between a noun and a verb. Adverbs can also be moved around a clause. The exact positions an adverb phrase can go are dependent on the constituent boundaries, but if it can go at, say, the beginning of the clause, before the verb, after the verb, at the end of the clause, you likely have an adverb on your hand. And like attributive adjectives, adverbs are kind of optional. You can remove them and it won't change the grammaticality. They provide extra information, often about manner or time or place, but that extra information is semantic. It's, it's not required for the sentence and construction to be grammatical. Overall, adverbs are, in my opinion, a little bit of a dumping ground for all terms that don't fit the other word classes and as such are often identified negatively by ruling out all the other options. You may have heard the writing advice before to never use adverbs. However, taken literally, this advice would be very difficult to follow as adverbs include all sorts of very useful and, in my opinion, non-offensive terms. Even stuff like today, tomorrow, those are adverbs. With that said, let's move on. Prepositions. Another one with a little bit of interesting writing advice around. Semantically, these are terms that convey a spatial relationship. Like pronouns, prepositions are usually considered a closed class, but again, this is more about the class being resistant to new entries. Not that new prepositions are impossible. Prepositions are also a good example of how so-called closed classes do not necessarily need to be small, English having a count of prepositions in the hundreds. This is, of course, still a lot smaller than the noun, verb, adjective, adverb entry lists, but it's probably larger than you think. The most common ways for new prepositions to creep into a language are through borrowing from other languages and also through derivational affixes that convey a spatial relationship being used standalone as prepositions. Think about how post is a preposition but also a prefix. So I guess we initially stole that one from Latin too, so doubly proving my point. In any case, prepositions are not a good place to look for derivational morphology and they also do not involve Reflect. As a word class in English, these guys are all about the syntax. Prepositions can head prepositional phrases, which are formed from a preposition and then a noun phrase. In the evening, on the table, that sort of thing. Because noun phrases can have prepositional phrases in them, this also allows for an example of a recursion or the ability for language to get stuck in a loop. A noun phrase containing a prepositional phrase, which contains a noun phrase, which contains a prepositional phrase, and so on until the sun dies. Prepositional phrases can function as either complements or adjuncts within a sentence. Adjuncts are entirely optional. They add extra information about place, time, manner, all the same sorts of things that adverbs are doing because, well, adverbs are also functioning as adjuncts. Complements are a little different. They are heavily implied by the verb and in many cases are required. The clause won't be completed without them. Her use was inspired. Her use of what? We don't know and we kind of want to know. Her use of cumin was inspired. That's better. Her use of cumin in the mac and cheese was inspired. Do we need in the mac and cheese? It's certainly helpful info to have, but grammatically it's not required. Of cumin is a compliment and in the mac and cheese is an adjunct. What about a sentence like, when I grow up, I want to be a cat? What's that up doing? It sounds an awful lot like a preposition. It's a term that can convey a spatial relationship. The cat ran up the tree. That up is a preposition. It's heading a prepositional phrase with a noun phrase embedded. And that prepositional phrase is acting like an adjunct. So up can certainly be a preposition. But is it a preposition in the sentence? When I grow up, I want to be a cat. It's followed by a pronoun, but we can show that pronoun, the I, is a subject of the verb want. It's in the subject form. So the I is part of a different clause and the up is not creating a prepositional phrase or with a noun phrase embedded. It's actually working together with the verb grow to form what we call a phrasal verb. In this context, the up would probably be labeled as either an adverb, because remember, adverb is used as a bit of a dumping ground for the edge cases, 
or it's also just called a particle and kind of left at that. It's certainly not functioning in the way a preposition usually does. Indeed, function-wise, it's really working as part of the verb. I'll leave this one for you guys to make your own arguments about how it's best classified, but worth raising, if anyone gives you trouble over ending a sentence in a preposition, just argue that a preposition requires a noun phrase. Therefore, it's not a preposition and you haven't done anything wrong. Bearing in mind you haven't done anything wrong. Okay, moving on. Determinants. I've been referencing determinants throughout this video, however, they are one of the word classes with the most debate and variance between grammaticians in exactly what a determinant is. In English, that are and an are all determinants, and probably it's easiest just to know that. There isn't anything morphological you can use to identify them, but syntactically they can precede nouns and cannot be modified by adverbs. This criteria leaves open the possibility for a few more terms to potentially also be classified as determiners, notably possessive pronouns like her, her cat, her cat is currently being naughty and trying to eat the plant on the desk. There is also debate around the exact role determiners play within a noun phrase, whether they are modifying the head, which is the main noun, or whether they are the head. So just a heads up, you might see what I've been calling noun phrases labeled as determiner phrases. Finally, English also has two types of conjunctions or words used to join and link phrases and clauses together. Now, I will do a video just on conjunctions once we get to discussing multi-clause sentences. So I'll leave things simple for the moment. Like determiners, conjunctions are syntactically identified. There's really nothing going on morphologically with almost all. English conjunctions being a single free morpheme, but syntactically they are readily identified as they join clauses together. Coordinating conjunctions join two independent clauses together, that is to say both clauses are able to stand alone, while subordinating conjunctions are used to join dependent clauses onto an independent one. Pendant clauses cannot stand alone. As well as joining clauses together, some conjunctions can also be used to join phrases together. For example, and the cat and the dog played happily in the yard. The cat is a noun phrase, or I mean potentially a determiner phrase, but we'll, we'll, we'll just leave things a noun phrase for a moment. The cat is a noun phrase, the dog is a noun phrase, and and is joining them together. And can usually only be used to join like phrases together, so can also be another way of testing the syntactic category of a phrase. If you know the category of another phrase, can you join the two together with and? You could potentially argue that ellipsis has been used and it's really two clauses being added together by and. The cat played happily in the yard and the dog played happily in the yard. For myself, this seems like trying to force the syntactic category into a desired definition and the analysis that conjunctions can also join phrases together just seems to be a simpler explanation. And finally, finally, we have interjections. Though whether this is a syntactic category or more the absence of a syntactic category, yeah, we'll leave that up to you. But these refer to all those little words that are kind of just interrupting to express emphasis or yell out in pain or sometimes just expletives. Damn, that hurt, or ouch, or ooh, I have an idea. And all those little sounds, they're called interjections. And they're not really identified by morphology or syntax, more so than the absence of any grammatical component. All right, that's it. That's our speed run through the syntactic categories of English. As a reminder, grammar is an attempt to describe the internal rules governing usage of a language. And so there are different frameworks, different attempts at describing this. Linguistics as an academic field is based heavily around argumentation, presenting evidence to support an analysis, not so much strict clear-cut rules you need to memorize. With that said, getting to a place where you can form strong, well-constructed arguments for alternative analyses does involve having a firm basis of background knowledge, and I believe the information I've presented today is at an appropriate level of depth for my overarching discussion of defining criteria for a grammatical sentence in standard English. I do just want to flag things do get complex and multiple analyses exist with various strengths and weaknesses. And 
I have been simplifying things. And with that, I believe we are now in a good place to start talking about clauses next instalment and then how clauses can be combined into compound and complex sentences. Before we know it, we'll be done with full stops and on to the next punctuation mark in the never ending exploration of punctuation. But for now, that's it from me. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and see you again soon. Thank you.